prayer and the ministry of the word, not to serve tables, which not saying that serving tables isn't uh, uh, important, but it is important, but yet it's a different function. And the pastor or pastors or other leaders in the church can't do everything. It takes the whole church. It takes everyone to fit in their particular uh, responsibility so it can get done. The following are two things every deacon should possess, and we said that, is number one, the servant's heart. Jesus puts servanthood at the top of the list for leaders. If we're going to be a leader, and we've done leadership stuff around here since, you know, since we began, you know, we've always done leadership stuff. And one of the things that you understand about leadership is that you have to serve. Uh, if you want to measure your greatness, I just heard a man say this in a speech. He's not a Christian, but not that I know it, but it, I was listening to his speech anyway. And his speech was, if you want to measure a leader, measure how he picks up a piece of paper. Measure how he picks up a piece of paper. And that, that's so important because leadership is serving them. And number two, a willingness, a leader uh, or a deacon must have a willingness to work. Deacons should be comfortable getting their hands dirty. In other words, elbow grease. Everybody say elbow grease. Elbow grease. The apostle goes on to say in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, which we covered, a deacon must be respected by others. In other words, grave, a good character. A deacon must not be two-faced or double-tongued, as the King James puts it, double-tongued or deceitful. A deacon must not be a drinker. In other words, it says not given to much wine, but we went painstakingly through some of the scriptures to show you that any wine that makes you drunk or that has the ability to get you drunk is the kind of wine that deacons or leaders should not be drinking. A deacon must not crave wealth or not be greedy as King James says, greedy of filthy lucre. And number five, a deacon must be fully committed be a fully committed and mature follower of Christ. Holding, it says in the King James, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. In other words, he's got to have faith, but he's got to be a mature believer. And number six, the deacon must be tested before confirmed. And again, King James says he must be proven. He must be tested. He must be tried. In other words, observed and looked at to see if he or she is able to serve. Continuing now, where we're at tonight, continuing in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, we read, Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, but sober, faithful in all things. The word wives is often translated wives, women, or deaconess. Wives, women, or deaconess. Now there really isn't any word for the word deaconess, but they use it, they translate it into that word deaconess in different areas, and different translators do that. So there, you know, some, and if you, if this, when you talk about this particular area, we have covered that in some sense, and we'll cover a little bit tonight, where there are strong views on whether or not women can serve in any capacity of the church where there's given voice. In other words, they have a voice, or they have any uh, type of uh, say when it comes to authority or anything like that. But in here, it's, this word is translated wife, women, or deaconess. The question I have to this audience, first of all, the question, can a woman serve in the office of a deacon? Anybody want to tackle that? Because you're smarter than I am. Brother Ralph? Oh. Can a woman serve in the office of a deacon? All right, we got a brave one back here. Who's going to be my runner? <laughs> Sister Mehe. Been in church since Moses came out of Egypt, so she's got the answer. I believe that women can be a deaconess because um, a deacon is a servant, and women have servant's heart, in the heart of a servant. Okay. And to serve people, I mean, I, I, I've never been a deaconess, but I've served a lot of people, and I believe that that's what the calling of a deacon is. Okay. Good. So I'm sure a woman can be as well. Anybody else? Even opposing views are, are welcome. Sister Mila over here. She was right behind Sister Mihia on that. Coming out of Egypt. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
Right. I believe um, women should be a deaconess because, you know, women start serving. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the First Testament, Paul wrote about women should be silent. Mm -hmm. But Jesus himself used women right. to go proclaim the word, even with the woman, uh, Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. You know, he had set a specific time to come by the water of the well, and she was there at that particular time, so he ministered to her. Right. And then after that, and she got what she needed, and she went on and said, hey, come and see a man that told me about everything that I did. Right. So she was basically an evangelist. Mm -hmm. You know, as you say, she could be an evangelist, you know, but she was a servant. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Have any thoughts on that? Can a woman be a deacon? Deaconess. All right. Dr. Thompson. Uh, I, I would say yes to that question. We have still an Aquila husband and wife. Uh, we had uh, Phoebe, who also worked in roles, worked with Paul. Um, Women have the same. There's, there's no uh, men doesn't don't have any more preference in terms of the use of God in their life or how he uses the mm -hmm. woman. So I would say yes. Okay. One of the things that I really want to bring out here is that this is most of you know that I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't come in the church until I was 26 years old, and so everything that I observed, I observed uh, objectively. I didn't really do it subject. I wasn't trying to interject anything. And I was actually observing how the church operated and how people, you know, the Bible says that Jesus, he, he sat against the treasury one time and here's what he did. And, and he, he observed how men gave, okay? He looked at the content of their heart based on the way that they were giving in the offerings. Some of them became very proud. Some of them became very humble. One lady came with two mites. Remember the two mites? And she gave it, and, and he told his disciples, he, looked, he said, look, all these people are given lots of, large amounts of money, but this lady has given more than all of them because she gave them everything that she had. Those two mites was all that she had, and she gave everything. So she gave, in, in comparison, she gave more than all of them. And so as I looked at the church, and I began to look at the church, I, I saw, as Jesus saw, men and women, jockey for position to sit next on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side. Now, I was used to that in the world because I was that type of guy. Every position that I ever had, and I had a lot of good positions, and every position that I had in my profession, I put myself in those places to where I would be next in line, or they would look my way when they look, but it was all strategically done because I knew, number one, I had the skill, and number two, I had the desire, and I felt like it was for me. And so it had nothing to do with God. It had everything to do with me. But when I looked at the church, I saw men and women doing the same thing that I've done as long as I can remember. And so I made it a pact with God. I said, God, here's what I won't do. I will not ever jockey, place myself, position myself for anything in your kingdom, ever. Everything that I get, everything that comes my way, and it could be just mopping these floors, everything that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna allow you to do it. So I cast off every desire that I have for anything, any positions or anything. And I wasn't even looking at positions because I'm just looking at just what, I just wanted to be saved. But I knew me. And so I'm glad I did that early on because as I looked at the church, I saw that they were doing that, and I said, you know, I'm never going that way. And so when you start putting out titles, pastor, deacons, whatever, elders, whatever you want to choose, there will always be a group that wants to position themselves to be that district elder, to be, you know, general superintendent, or whatever, next in line to the throne. And when we come to... When we talk about things like this, sometimes our natural man wants to come up and say, well, this person can't do it, and that person can't do it, and if I can't do it, they can't do it, and I want it. And God is just saying, look, it's, it's going based down to what all of you are saying right here. Sir.
servant who did. Who really wants to serve? God will use who's available. He used Deborah. We talked about that. Deborah was a prophet. The Bible says that. There are people here today who don't believe that women can prophesy. Can't open their mouth. Can't speak above a natural conversational tone. Heard this with my own ears. Without, 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 and I've been already criticized online about this, but so let's just take it to another level. This was probably getting me going. <laughs> they named me specifically, so anyway. Can't raise their voice beyond a normal conversation. And so Deborah prophesied. She was a judge. Read about it in Judges chapter 4. Anna prophesied. And she was at the time of Jesus. Sat at the temple and prophesied daily. She was a prophet. The Bible calls her a prophet. Men and women. Acts chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says. Men and women shall prophesy. Philip the evangelist. Somebody said Sister uh, uh, Mila said over Philip the evangelist had four girls. All of them were prophets. And they prophesied. Now, notice what the apostle said in Romans chapter 16, verse 1. And it'll come up on the screen. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. He said, I commend unto you, and, and Dr. Uh, Thompson said it this way. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant. The word they use there is a deaconos, which means a minister or deacon of the church. So there might be disagreements because of our humanity. And it may rub you wrong. And it may be that based upon my upbringing or my church upbringing, that it may be hard for me to swallow. I'll tell you this. Paul had no problem saying, this is a deacon. Oh. A deaconess, because she's female. And so he used the same word that he would use as a male deacon, he used on the female deacon. Now, you can parse it. You can look at it. You can go through any translation you want. You can go back to the Greek, Hebrew, and your background or whatever you, were, you grew up with. It is still going to come out the same way. Deacon. So, there's something about that I, I think I really try and, and want to do and to drill into. And that's why I opened up for questions and, and stimulate your mind. Is that you've got to get to the place that you're in the Word. And then sometimes the Word on, on certain places you look at, how can that be? Well, you have to search it out. Why did Jesus say it this way? Why did Paul say it this way? Why did Timothy go this route? Why, did the, why is the Bible written in this way? And as you dig a little deeper, God is not uh, looking at us like, you know, you're better, you're worse, you're limited, you have all this. No, he's looking at it. Who's qualified? Here, his qualification is, can they serve? Can they minister? Will they give their life for this? Will they do the hard thing, hard work? Amen? Anyway, take it from there. Right about me online. Make a YouTube video. <laughs> That's what they did, made a YouTube video. So, come on. Take a whole 45 minutes made a YouTube video about me. I can't. All right. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, Paul outlines the qualification for a deacon's wife. I'm using it in the sense of a deacon's wife. I believe that in this passage, there is debate whether or not he was talking about her being a deacon. Because this word is translated to deacon. It is tra translated that it could be he's talking to her as being a deacon. But I believe contextually that he's talking to the deacon and his spouse. That's where we're going to use it here. Number one, a deacon's wife must be respected by others. She must be also brave and of good character. And it may be that once you become that, you may not have all that good character, but you're still working on it. We're all working on our character, right? Who has the best character in here? Anybody? I mean, you got outstanding character. Not all the time. I mean, you know, we have it. We try and strive for having it all the time, but we don't always have good character. We all have flaws, but she must be great. Good character, respected by others. Here's the question. Should a deacon's wife be held to the same high standard as her husband? Now we're looking at the, the deacon, and now we're looking at his spouse, who's not a deacon. Should she be held to the same standard, all the way back, same standard as her husband? 
of the wagon? I would say yes. Um, Explain your answer. The reason is because when you look at a man, the woman is a shadow of the man. Okay? Supposed to stand support her. Okay? Yeah. So if she can't support him right, then it would be contrary. So the woman is, thank you, the woman is a reflection of the man. So if you have a deacon and you have a wife and the wife is like crazy. <laughs> it reflects bad on the man, right? Could be vice versa too. I mean, it's just the way it is, you know. <laughs> but I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I know, because that's subjective, yeah. Crazy. In the sense that you're doing stuff that's not right, biblically. I would say that. I'm, not, I'm being very facetious when I say crazy. But say it because we're all getting a little crazy in the sense. But if, if doing things that would be uh, unbiblical and that would bring a bad light on the gospel, really, is when I say crazy, you know, and doing some crazy stuff. Sister so Mila back there. Question. Can a woman, it was, uh, can, should a deacon's wife be held to the same standard? As her husband. Yeah, yes, amen. Because um, when the man is called and he's married, so, you know, his wife is in that position too because yeah. they're not two, they're one. Right. So they're both called under right. that position. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. And let, me, let me say this about that. I'm glad you mentioned about calling because calling has a lot to do with going into different positions, feeling called to do that. It's just like, for instance, my calling. My calling as a pastor. And I'm going to kind of differ a little bit from you, since I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm just saying the way I, I'm viewing it. Uh, my wife wasn't necessarily called as a pastor. She serves in a role to support me. And one of the things that I have, those of you who've been through our, our, our phase classes and, and our next step class, is the first thing I said, my, my wife's primary job in this church, although she's very talented and gifted in a lot of areas, but her main job in this church is to take care of me, to maintain me, to make sure I can still go the distance. My wife, when I married her, she was 21 years old, and I was 31 years old. I had been through a lot of life. My wife had been through zero life when I married her. And so I realized later on that my wife put everything on hold, even to the day she is now, she's 47 years old, uh, put everything on hold to do what God called me to do and to serve in that position alongside of me with distinction, with honor, with a smile, and say, where you go, I go. Your people are my people. You know, all that. And so, yes, when, when a deacon is appointed, and should the woman be held to the same standard? Yes, because she reflects him, but also that, that calling does flood over to her. It floods over into her life, and people will hold her to that same standard, just like your children. Sometimes, even when your children, if your children, I can't tell you how, what my children do, but whatever, if they do something wrong, it still reflects on us. It isn't that I'm going to say, you better do this, or, you know, because I want to look this way. It's just a natural thing that happens that it comes back on us. And, and it, it happens from time to time. So, yeah, they should be held, I believe, to the same standard as a deacon because there is a reflection. Amen? We have a, yes? How do you know? Into the mic, please, so we have it. How do you know or can discern what your calling is? Good. Go through phase one, two, three, and four. <laughs> That's a commercial. Look, <laughs> it'll help you to, to whittle it down to what your calling is. And just to give you in a nutshell how you can kind of uh, start looking towards what you're called to do. One of them is you'll have the desire to do it, okay? And then you'll develop the ability to do it. And then others around you will begin to tell you, you need to be doing that. That's just, just a quick answer for it. But I, I really believe that everyone should be praying about what their calling is. But you've got to give yourself. A lot of times God's, I heard somebody say this just recently, God is not going to tell you your calling if you're not obeying this already. If you're not obeying what's already written, then he's not going to reveal to you what your calling is. Because first, we've got to say, Lord, I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to follow you wholly and completely. And then God will begin to open the scriptures to you. He'll reveal your calling. Why would he reveal your calling? And he knows that you're not, you're not going to be obedient to what he told you to do. Hmm. You'll have glimpses of it. You know, you'll feel something. But it's almost like it's just 
just out of your reach. And I'll tell you, if you'll submit yourselves, therefore, unto God, He will begin to open up your calling. If you'll follow Him all the way, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things, even our callings, will be added unto us. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Or? Okay, let's move on. Number, number uh, two, talking about a deacon's wife. A deacon's wife must not be a gossiper. Ooh. <laughs> she slanders. She shouldn't slander. She shouldn't speak evil of others is what it means. Not speaking evil of other people. And the best ones to combat that is the deacon. Mm -hmm. Talking to his wife. Because a deacon can get real mad if somebody else was talking to his wife. You know, trying to correct his wife. It's better that the deacon or the leader or whomever is correcting their home. You know, say, look, and even in conversations between my wife and I, I'm just going to use this as an example because I can't get in trouble that way. But we correct each other sometimes when it may not be good. It may not be gossip, but it may be, you know, on my part, it may be anger. You know, and my wife would say, oh, oh hold on, trigger. <laughs> <laughs> But she's correcting me. Or I may have to correct her. And it's in this area of gossip, even speaking evil of other people, the best one to do it will be the deacon himself. Question, what would you consider gossip? That may be a wide range right there. What do you consider gossip? Anybody? Sister Tam, Tammy, right here. I'm going to get you in a second in the, in the mic. What do you consider gossip? Sharing something that you gave in confidentiality, in confidence, and, and she violated, violated confidentiality and, and shared private information with someone else. Okay? What do you consider gossip over here? What's your name? Ella. Ella? Ella. Anything judgmental. Anything judgmental on others. On another person. Okay, let me ask you a question on that. What if... You're judging something that's true. Is that considered judgmental? Or passing judgment? Passing judgment. Okay. Passing judgment. Anyway, back here. Let me hear Sit with me here. Supposedly. Tonight. Tonight. Where um, someone is slandering another person or speaking evil of that person, whether. The, the person is doing something wrong or not. I'm not saying that they're right by doing right. it wrong, but it's not our place to talk about that person to another person of their wrongdoing. Okay. Not our place to talk not about even, someone else that of their wrongdoing to another person. Right. Party. And not even in a way um, that they say, you know, this person is doing this and I think we should really pray for them. Yeah. Use the guys of prayer, yeah, that's, right? That's, yeah, I got a whole list of things I want to pray about today. Right. And this is one of them, but this is who it's about. Right. Sanctified gossip. Sanctified gossip. Yeah. That's a good one right there. That's a good one. That, that one. Three. Yeah. Oh. Oh. She's still right there. Um, but looking at this, it says Deacon's wife. That's speaking a lot to the ministry. That, that's really reflective of the ministry. Right. Uh, it is. It is reflective of ministry, but ministry is observed by laity. And that's the reason I ask the questions. And, and it's not you giving instructions to the ministry, but it's how you view the ministry and what you expect. It's just like this. If I were to go into the world and I had a microphone like this, and I gave it to people, and I asked them, what is a Christian? And they will begin to tell you what a Christian should be, or in their view what a Christian should be. And a lot of times, Christians already know that, but yet they say, well, you know, we've, al we've already got in. You know, we can, feel play we can play around. It's kind of like, I want my cake and eat it too, or I, I need to take a break today. And the world has not given us a break. And it's just like ministry, the church, really, 
should not give us a pass on this. So that's why I'm asking for your com comments because hopefully ministers and stuff hear you and see what they think. Yes, Ellen. Come on up, Parkers. Come on up here. We want you up front okay, here. Okay, so if you're in the church, like the Bible says, you know, if you're in the church, you're in the Instead of going, okay, undeaconess. <laughs> Instead of going around gossiping about her, are we supposed to take it to the deacon so that he can continue? So that he can continue. Okay. Good question. Where's the answer? What's the scriptural answer? Did we have a, somebody speaking over here? What's the scriptural answer to that question? First, go to the person. Try to address it. Try and address it. And then, if it's not resolved, to if it's not resolved, to bring in a person. Bring another person. And then, if that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Uh, okay. Then you bring it to the <laughs> yeah. church. You bring it to the church. You mainly bring bring it to the leadership. And so that's good. And she's one of the pastors on staff here, so she understands that protocol. And the thing about it is, we don't do it biblically. So we don't get the biblical answers. Right. You know, and then if we start doing things biblically, we'll get the biblical result. But if we do it our own way, take it into our own hands, or take it to other people that have nothing to do with it. I mean, me and Mejia don't have a problem with Sister Mulaney. And all of a sudden, I start talking to Mejia about Sister Mulaney. Now, all of a sudden, the Mejia's got a problem with Sister Mulaney. Sister Mulaney doesn't know that the Mejia's have a problem with her. With her. Then all of a sudden, me and Sister Mulaney make up. But the, the Mejia's are still mad at Sister Mulaney. And it's all because of my gossip. They weren't even involved in it. They weren't privy to it until I opened my big mouth and started talking to them. And now they're looking at her differently and cross-eyed. They used to love her. You know, she's just a worshiper. But I, I told them something that they said, oh, she's not a worshiper. Now they're afraid of her. <laughs> and then I make up with her. I'm sorry, I talked about you behind your back and everything. And I told somebody one time, I said, you know, I don't mind you talking about me behind my back. And the guy was just saying, ah, and I said, brother, brother, brother. <laughs> and I gave him some instances and said, I know, I know a lot more than I let on, but I'm telling you. And the only reason I'm telling you is I'm okay with it. Just don't talk about my wife again. <laughs> I said, then we got problems. I said, because all of it's unfounded anyway. I said, so why would you do that? But for me, I don't mind you. So you can talk about me all you want. You can say whatever you want about me just because you don't like me. I said, I'm fine with that. I said, this don't ever, I, I promise you I'll never. And even, I, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I'm, I won't do that about your wife again. Then I saw him one time at a conference. <laughs> And he said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good, man. How you doing? He said, I've been talking about you. <laughs> he did. He said, I've been talking about you. I said, fine, man. I wasn't even mad. As long as I'm talking about my wife. You know, and trying to get to me. That's the point. That was his whole point. And so, look, we have to harness the gossip. It breaks up, you know, whispering. The Bible calls it whispering. Whispers. It tells the bearers of tales. It, it destroys things. That's why Paul even tells him at one time, he says if you're, if you're a young woman and your spouse dies prematurely and you find yourself a widow and you're young, he says, get married again. Don't go from house to house and, you know, just talking about stuff and, and carrying around rumors and get married because you're going to have some kids and you're going to get busy. You know, I'm tired of gossip. You know, so... So that's basically where he was going with that. So anyway, gossip. We we have to we have it's natural for us to want to tell a tale and to to spread rumors and all that. But you got to harness yourself, harness those around you, and deacons, wives especially, it says they should not be gossipers because they should be able to be able to be told a lot and hold it. In. Okay, there's some things that I'll, I'll go to the grave with. And my wife doesn't. Even there's some things that I'll go to the grave with, that I talk to people about. There's some things that I do talk with her about. But there's other things that she understands this. Don't be the type of deacon's wife that you have to know everything. You know, if they say, well, yeah, 
this thing because I can't talk to you about it. Fine. Some things you have to take to the grave with you because that's the way it's got to be. And so it's not that you're supposed to share it with everyone or as the Mania said, let's have some sanctified prayer over them. I got a whole list of folks I want to talk about today. You know. And let me say, preachers are good for that. Preachers are good for that. And so, you know, they, I've heard preachers good throughout the years preach on this subject and really uh, put the spank in on preachers, which is good because we need that as well. So, again, thank you for your uh, participation there. Number three, a deacon's wife must be self-controlled. This means sober-minded or clear-minded. She must be self-controlled. She, she can't be quick-tempered. You know, gets on your nerves. Every, it's, everybody gets on my nerves. You know, they may get on your nerves, but you need to be sweet and kind and gentle. Self-control, controlling oneself. Tempered is talking about being temperate. Tempered, not out of control. There's nothing worse than seeing a leader, and I'm spreading it to a leader, a leader's spouse out of control because then the person that's ministering or been called to the ministry it's harder for them to function like they need to function and they have the respect that they deserve and you say amen and number four a deacon's wife must be worthy of trust a deacon's wife must be worthy of trust that means she must be faithful and honest. Faithful and honest. Not a liar. Not lying. Now you may have a lying tongue. You might, you know, just lurks out your mouth. You know, this. Uh, gotta, gotta bring it back. You know, so I remember, and at least my daughter, when she was young, she, she used to lie, man. I mean, she's just, <laughs> why are you lying? I don't know. He didn't even have to lie. Is it more than no? It's just lying. I don't know if any of your kids ever went through that stage, but my, yep. just for nothing, you know. But that's a, just part of the fall, you know. The lying tongue—it's just it's part of the fall, fall, the fall of mankind, and it it, it it can be in there. But a deacon's wife is that she, she should be worthy of trust. In other words, faithful of an honest report. Question. What does faithfulness, because it says in all things, in all things mean to you? Because you'll notice that the King James things is not, uh, wasn't given in the original, but it was added for the clarification here. But it says in all, and then taking it further, in all things. What does faithfulness in all things mean to you? Anybody? Brother Williams first, and we'll go on the side. To me, it, it just means balancing. So, some people, you know, they may be faithful to church, but not faithful in paying their taxes. Yeah. You know, I mean, just just everything, just kind of seeing the faithfulness and straight across. Balance. Balancing it out and not just only spiritual, or if I get to preach, I'm, I'm faithful, I'm a good preacher, but don't want to come to church if I'm not preaching. Correct. You know what I'm trying to say? That kind of faithful in all things. She should be faithful in all things, trustworthy, meaning she must be balanced. The word you use was balanced. Balanced. Across the board. In a lot of different areas. I believe that when I hear faithful, I think I remember once on Pastor Haney, I, my husband asked Pastor Haney if he could marry me. Mm -hmm. Pastor Haney said, yes, of course. She's a faithful woman. Yeah. Well, faithful to me is I, when I gave my life at 23 and now I'm going to be 60. Yeah. I had already had purpose in my heart to be faithful to him, right. to God. And faithfulness to prayer, to him, prayer, communication with him. And the word caused me to be faithful to the house of God, to be faithful to my husband, to be faithful to the things that he has called me to do. 
So when you're faithful to God in prayer, in your, in your word, you're going to be faithful in all areas of your life. Right. Perfect? No. But you will be faithful to God yes. you are, when you're faithful. Amen. Anybody else? Let me say that faithfulness it, and isn't always uh, pleasant. It isn't always feel good to be faithful in all things. Sometimes you're not going to feel like put like that. Sometimes you're not going to feel like being faithful. Whether you're talking about in your giving, whether you're talking about in your attendance, whether you're talking about in your marriage, whether you're, whatever, faithful in your responsibilities as a dad or a mom. Deaconess, it says that she must be faithful in all things. The deacon's wife should be faithful in all things. Why? Because it reflects and it, it, it actually uh, touches every part of her life. It, it begins to streamline through everything. And it isn't, like you said over here, it's not that we're per they're perfect, but the point is that they're striving. Lord, help me to be faithful. Help me to be honest with myself. Help me be honest with other people. Help me, Lord God, to be a faithful woman so that I can carry out and do what you call me to do at its optimum. And, and, and it's not always feeling good because people, people look at all areas of your life. And you think you got, man, I got it going on over here. And then all of a sudden they look at this area. You know, and they said, well, you need some, some uh, tuning up. <laughs> I remember when I was going to uh, Korea, we had 80 guys that were going to get, went out for the martial arts team, the taekwondo team in the military that came out for the team. All of us spent two weeks together, training together and everything like that, fighting. We all fought each other and stuff like that. And they were only going to select eight guys out of 80. And one of the things that they talked us, the coaches and everybody and all the different trainers that we had, and when they sat it down at the end of two weeks and everything, we sat there and they were making a selection of who was going to. One of the things that they talked about was faithfulness. And they looked at character. They said our selection is not just based upon fighting. Because when you go over to Korea, you're not only going to represent yourself and our team, but you're going to represent the United States of America. And they said, and we want, and we have selected eight individuals that we believe, not only that they can fight, but their character, their faithfulness, their diligence, their, their discipline, and everything that they do. Because they wanted to explain to us that this isn't just because you can ax kick somebody into tomorrow, but that you can do that, and when you come back down, you have good character, and you're representing our country. They, they talked about this, and then they called out the eight guys. And I would thank God was one of me. <laughs> Praise God. But this is the same way when we're talking about positions like this. It's people are looking at your character all across. Deacons and deacons and those wives of deacons. Situation. And I said axe kick. <laughs> My wife says, it doesn't sound like you're saying that right when I do this. <laughs> Ass, you know, like chop. <laughs> um, one, one word that comes to mind for faithfulness is consistency. Consistency. Um, when you're consistent, people around you know that you're not going to waver because right. you're the same. You're not based on, it's not based on how you feel. Right. That was one thing that my mom instilled in us with our kids is be consistent with your kids. You know, you can't punish them today, and then they do the same thing tomorrow, and you let them do whatever they want because you're tired or whatever. And the same thing with faithfulness, you know. The people that you're serving, they can depend on you because they know that you're consistent, and you're, you're going to follow through what you say you're going to do. Right. That's good. Consistency. Anybody else before we move on? Other ways? One more thing about faithfulness. You have to practice it just like being unfaithful the same way. Have to practice faithfulness. Exactly, and that's the key. Practice will make perfect. And and if you're trying to say that I'm perfect or I, I have to be perfect when I start, it's unrealistic. Practice, practice, practice. Put one foot in front of the other and say, you know what? I'm going to be better. Next year, I'm going to be more faithful than I was this year. You know, and, and I'm going to work on a, a lot of areas of my life, balanced, and I'm going to look at all the different areas in my life. And a deacon's wife is just an example of what they should be. Final words to the deacon. Verse 12. Final words to the deacons. Number one, a deacon must only have one wife. Everybody got that? One woman man. Or 
one man, woman. <laughs> you got to have one wife, uno. And I think I said this, but I think it's worth, worth saying again. Uh, Brother Rash said he was a missionary for many, many years, over 30 years as a missionary. And he went into one village. And in the village, there was this one guy who got converted to Christianity, got the Holy Ghost and everything. You know, he got converted and he had all these wives. He had all these wives. So he comes to Brother Ash. It's a true story. He comes to Brother Rash and he says, so uh, the Bible says I'm only going to have one wife. He said, what do I do? He said, choose one. <laughs> so he, real story. That's what he told him. He said, choose one. So he did. He chose one of the wives and that's what he's married to. <laughs> With the plethora of wives. Number two, a deacon must manage his household well. And again, remember, this is a learned behavior. Managing your household well. The word manage, or being a good steward, something like that. The word manage is a big word because it means organization. He's got to manage his household well. A man, let me just say this. About, I know we're talking about deacons, but let me say as a man. A man's job is tough. It, it really is. My son doesn't realize doesn't understand, and he just starting to understand, but he didn't realize how tough things are until he began to start doing things as a man himself. And responsibility, right, Brother Tune, of a man. Right, Brother Martin? The responsibilities of a man are huge. I mean, we can gloss over it, we can act like it's nothing, but it's, it's big, and it's, it becomes overwhelming. And Mike is expressive anyway, so he's telling me about this, man, it's, that's tough. And it's organization, it's management. And it says of a deacon, it says he's got to learn to manage his house well. Because it's not just about his house, but it's how his house responds and fits into the ecclesia, the church. How, he, how the house functions around the church. Because the church, now you're living in a glass house. People are throwing stones. And they're saying stuff and they're doing stuff, but you've got to be able to handle it too and absorb it. Because it's just the way it is. So he's got to be able to manage his house well. And this is a learned behavior. I put it down there. And number three, a deacon who serves well increases in honor and faith. A deacon that serves well increases in honor and faith. Verse 13 says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree that means gain respect from others and great boldness in the faith in other words gain more confidence which is in Christ Jesus their honor others will begin to look at if we, if we serve well in the office of the deacon their, their honor people will begin to respect them hold them in high esteem, not worship them, but they say, you know what? That's a trustworthy brother. I can depend on that guy right there. If, I ask, if he's telling me he's going to do something, he's going to do it. If I go to him for advice, he's going to give me the best advice. It may not even be the right advice, but he's going to give me the best advice that he can give me. It isn't that they're know all, they know it all, they can do all. It just means like we're, we're humans just like you. We're going to give you the best advice that we can give you. And that's all God really wants. And then they'll begin to increase in faith. Their confidence in Jesus Christ will begin to soar. Why? Not just because they're deacons. And not because they're doing the right things. But other people are affirming them and helping them. And, and, and validating them and saying, you know what? You're doing a good job. And then they, they look at God and they say, you know, man, this is, this is, this is good. They start believing. Do you know, you, just like a wife... A wife can sap the, the living life out of a man. <laughs> Why well, don't you husbands like that? I mean, it's just the natural law. That's why they have the statement, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If daddy ain't happy, nobody cares. <laughs> but if mama ain't happy, I'll tell you. It's because they have this power within them to make or break a man. Be careful who you marry. 
because they have the ability to make or break you. And see, that's huge. But it shows the power of a woman. It also shows the responsibility of a man. And I'll tell you, when they have that come right, but if the, the woman is affirming and building and, and, and not coddling, but building the man, what happens is he feels like, man, I can conquer hell with a squirt gun. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> no one is going to die. But we need back here. things that you begin to work on. For ladies, you work on it. For men, you work on it. Because that's the goal. That's where you want to go. Nobody has it all together. That's why people, when they first get married, they think, man, we're going to have the best marriage and everything. No, you're going to have valleys, and you're going to have peace. You're going to have successes, and you're going to have failures. It's all in how you deal with it, how you learn along the way. And those you gather around you to give you good information on how to endure the storm. And when you get that together, things go better. So a deacon's wife can make a break, but also the deacon, he'll, he'll have faith. Yes, sir. Sister Mendoza. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I kind of just wanted to touch on the responsibility of a man, mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm not one. <laughs> but um, <laughs> talk a little bit about my husband. Yeah. Um, uh, we pastor in Mexico, in Tijuana. And... Before we were married, my husband was the most irresponsible man ever. Yeah. <laughs> he would tell you that he was going to do something. He never followed through. He never kept his word. It was something that drove me absolutely insane. But through the years and uh, through prayer, lots of prayer, lots of fasting, right. um, he began to basically man up. But I was telling him the other day, you know, the how far you have come. Like from the beginning now, he will not say a word unless he plans to fulfill it. Right. So he'd rather keep his mouth shut than to, to even, not even if it's not a promise, but just to say something and know that there's the possibility that he might not be able to do it. Right. So instead of doing that, he'll just stay quiet. But the responsibility that he has, he's told me in our marriage that, you know, as married couples, you kind of talk about things that you know were never going to happen, but hey, this is what we would do. Right. And he told me, if you ever went out and cheated on me, I would forgive you. Right. And I would love you, and I would have nobody to blame but myself. Right. And I was like, how would that be? You're going to blame yourself. I'm the one that went out and committed the deed. Right. And he said, because as the man and as the head, I should be in tune with your needs and what you needed. Right. And that is the responsibility of the husband and the man to know those things. And that spoke volumes to me, like, wow, the responsibility that a man, in that moment, I think, is when I realized, when you say that you never really know what our husbands carry. Right. To, but to be able to say that, that I would forgive you, I would have no choice but to forgive right. you, because it's my fault. Right. It's the amount that our husbands carry. And thanks for sharing that, you know, and, and this is, that's real life. You know, that's real life, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a deacon, whether you're a deacon wife, it doesn't matter, and because you're real people. And then you have real issues that you're dealing with that you bring to the marriage or to the table. You know, when I came to the table this marriage 26 years ago, I brought a lot of baggage because I've been married before, been through multiple marriages before, before getting saved. And, and so I came to a marriage. I got saved, got the Holy Ghost, been living for God for a number of years, but I had never been married as a saved man and this and that. But when I got into marriage, I realized, here's what I'm just being honest with you about me. I realized the old guy rose up because I'd never had a saved wife or this or that or, or responsibilities and yours was uh, uh, not being um, account, but you were able to count on him on different areas. But mine was that, that anger and that decision making and shutting out and everything. And I can remember the first argument my wife and I had and we were in a little apartment on West Lane and I'm already a preacher and um, 
we were having our first little argument, and we had been married a couple of months, whatever it was, had our apartment, no furniture yet, and we're there. And she said something to me, or did something to me, that uh, really made me mad. And it wasn't even mad. It was probably something like, you know, uh, you didn't close the drawer, and, and, and I just didn't close the drawer, so what, that kind of thing. Something that small. But I took it to another level, to the point, I remember she was in the kitchen cooking, and I, I took it to the level of saying, you know what, I will walk out on you, and you will never see this guy again in your life. Do you understand that? And she's cooking, and she said, she didn't really say anything, she just kind of looked at me. And I said, I said, you don't believe me? And she said, well, do what you got to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went into the bedroom, and I was good at it. Took all my clothes that were on the hanger, swooped them off in one swoop, had the sheet there, put them all on the sheet, folded that sheet in four corners. That means you can pick it all up at once. And pick that thing up there at once, and I'm going to get the front door. And I said, is there anything you want to say before you, I leave out this door? And she said, no. <laughs> she, she just kept cooking. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm, you, you think I'm joking? So now I'm getting up there. I said, you think I'm joking? She said, do what you got to do. <laughs> so I walk out the door, go down the steps, get in my car, throw the stuff in the truck, sat behind the wheel, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, what are you doing? But it was the old guy, preacher, loved God, Holy Ghost filled, but the old man that I had to learn new behavior. And I said, Right. I went back upstairs and when I opened the door, she said, Oh, you back? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm back. So I went in the bedroom, she was sitting down there, hung up my clothes, came out there, ate my dinner. <laughs> that was in our first couple of months. Have never, ever done anything like that ever again. God broke something in me, but it isn't that you have it all together, but it's good that I had a good woman. Thank God she wasn't the one that would throw up her hands or want to fight with me or something like that. You know, it, it might have been at a different level, but it was, God can do it. So I'm saying that on behalf of maybe some of you that have or are in a struggle or in a place where you think, man, oh, that deacon or that pastor or that somebody, they have it all together. No, 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 no. All of us have to start somewhere and come from something. I just try to be a little bit transparent enough so that you can see that I'm a human being as well. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. And tonight, before we close here, I just want us to come, come if you can, to the altar. Because I want to pray over you. If you can make your way to the altar and just stand here. And let's pray together. Let's pray for our leadership here at Lighthouse of the Valley. For our deacons for our pastoral leadership, for our ministries and leadership. Let's pray that God would have his hand on them and then let's pray for our families that we serve. You might be a deacon in your home, a pastor, an overseer, a bishop of your home, and God is saying, I, I wanna put my hand on you. I wanna help you. All of us start somewhere. Father, I pray over your people right now in the name of Jesus, that God, we will not fall short of what you intended for us. I pray over them, God, and I ask you to help them to rise to the level in which you are calling them. Lord, we pray for our leadership, Lord, of this church. Those that, Lord, are putting their backs to the wheel. Those that are, are sacrificing uh, different times in different areas. They're serving the people of God. I pray, God, with this host of people here today, that you'll lift them up and their children and their posterity, Lord. Allow them to bring glory to your name. Allow them to be encouraged today. Allow them to find rest in your kingdom. And Lord, let them be encouraged that they can be honored as well as grow in faith, Lord, as they serve you and as they serve your people. God, I'm asking you, Lord, for all the families that are represented, not only here, but in our church, and those that will be coming to our church, that they will find freedom, that they will find joy, 
They will find calling. They will find service. Lord, that they would respect one another, love one another, that they would love you most of all. But Lord, their families would grow. And Lord, anything that been, has been violated in our families, Lord, heal it right now. I'm asking for healing in our families right now. Healing in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions, in our marriages. Lord, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of the word, Lord, we need you to come through and minister in a mighty way. Just begin to call on the name of the Lord today for your family. For God is going to minister to your family. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And God is coming in and he's going to rescue you. He's going to give you what you need in the name of Jesus. He's going to give you answers. He's going to give you freedom. He's going to give you joy again. You're going to be able to lift up your head without shame and without doubting. Your hands will go up too in the name of Jesus. We praise you tonight, God. And we ask you to have your way in our children and in our children's children. Lord, we need you right now. And God, we praise you and honor you. And we give you the glory because you're worthy of all of it. Every single bit of it in Jesus' name. Can you say in Jesus' name? Go ahead and put your hands together. For me. God bless you all. Thank you for being here tonight. Greet each other as you go. Go in the name of the Lord and go serve wherever you're at. In Jesus' name.